um, a little bit about some of the work that I have done. So as John said, I'm a part of a number of different companies. Uh, I am a, a senior company member at 13th Floor, which is a devised theater company that specializes in immersive, interactive, and physical work. Uh, we do things that range from more traditional theater performances on stages to live action radio plays to immersive, mysterious ghost stories. Uh, and we really pride ourselves on being able to fit in any environment in any sort of setting. We've done theatrical events in swimming pools, in old libraries, uh, in the middle of festivals. It, we really pride ourselves on fitting anywhere. Uh, I also work for a private organization that throws multi-day, fully immersive and interactive large-scale events. Uh, I'm the narrative producer there. And what we do is we will take a venue and one to 2,000 people and we'll create a fully interactive environment in which participants can if they choose to take interact with characters, take on a character of their own, get involved, play a game, uh, go deep into the backwoods of the story, change the story, become a character, end up on stage even in some cases, uh, as if it was a real environment that lasts for four or five days. Uh, I also own with my creative partner, a real world game design studio called Playmore. We focus on creating physicalized playful experiences for adults, primarily in the corporate world. Uh, we throw events and playful things, real-world scavenger hunts, and large-scale getting-to-know-you games. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about different things that I've worked on in the past. Uh, but first, we're here to talk about stories. Uh, and so I want to tell you guys a little bit of a story. Uh, so most of the work that I do has come, uh, most of the work that I do ends up being large-scale and involves a lot of people. And so not only do I tell work that is sort of participatory in nature for the participants, but it's also very collaborative with the people who make the story. Uh, one of the events that we do uh, is we rent an entire hotel casino and we turn the entire interior of that environment into an immersive space. Uh, every single room in the hotel leads to uh, an immersive environment all of its own. The, each room is linked through with a storyline thread and all of it is tied together with some characters. In particular, we have one character uh, the madam who owns the hotel and has been there for many years. Uh, one time we wanted to tell a story where we were really concentrating on how we could drive the story that is so that is spread across, you know, multiple floors of a hotel, dozens and dozens of rooms, and still give it some continuity. Oftentimes one of the challenges here is that uh, when the doors are closed, the cells are, are divided from each other. It's hard to know what's going on in the next room or the next room. It's hard to keep a continuity in a thread. And oftentimes, telling a strong narrative in an immersive environment is a challenge. Uh, so we chose to solve this through characters. Uh, in this particular event, our, uh, our madam found herself pregnant and decided to turn her hotel into a utopia. She invited all the participants in and sealed the doors under the advice of her advisors, three characters that we called the shadows. Uh, the shadows were really meant to be the fly in our ointment. They, they were designed around these principles that no matter how best laid our plans could be, that there was always a problem from the inside. And that the problem isn't just an invading enemy, that the problem comes from ourselves. So we created these characters as reflections of our protagonist, as these sort of warped mirror shadows of herself. And they would whisper to her and get, fill her full of fears for her child. Uh, as the weekend event progressed, the utopia became slowly a centaurian dystopia obsessed with safety. Uh, but to do this, we created these characters called the shadows. Uh, the shadows were three interactive characters that were a sort of Cerberus. Uh, they had these sort of multi-headed, multi-fingered sort of aesthetic to them. And uh, not only did we base it on the fears and worries of our protagonist, but also of our audience. In our potential audience, we surveyed about 20 to 50 people talked about their fears for their day, their life, the next two years for them. And we wove that into a tapestry of, of lines and dialogue that the characters would exchange with each other. We also recorded that, ta that tapestry of dialogue to send it through processors and put it on speakers throughout the party. So wherever you went, there were whispers coming from the corners and underneath the shadows of these characters telling, sharing the fears and concerns of the people at that event. Uh, we also secreted speakers inside of the costume, so as they went, you would hear them. Uh, the reason I talk about this particular thing is I, I really like using 
uh, things that people care about as an engine for their investment. You know what I mean? Uh, people often uh, think that characters just having a hard time is going to be enough to bring people into your story. But these are characters that we really spent time researching and considering what would be impactful. And in that way, they ended up not just being villains, but like villains that we could relate to and that we really were attached to and that we cared about. Um, we're going to come back to some of this, but I thought it's always good to start with some, some version of an immersive project to bring our focus to. So let's talk a little bit more about stories. Um, so what are stories for? One of the things that's really special about human beings amongst all the animals is that we tell each other stories. It's one of the things that has made us stand out and accomplish some of the things that we have that's very distinct. Our ability to give narrative to each other creates a set of like capabilities that it's harder for other species to get. And when we think about these things, it, it helps us understand why we tell stories and why stories are still powerful throughout all this time, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, one of the reasons we tell stories is to help us understand the world and our place in it. And you can see this in stories that go back to like mythology and origin stories and things like that. But you can also see that about stories that we tell right now in the news or stories about our friends. Uh, we tell these stories to remind each other what the world looks like and so that we all have an agreed upon shape. And when you think about it that way, that means that the stories that we tell and share have a lot of power to influence how we view the world. Uh, Another thing that we use stories for is to create empathy. Uh, when you are in a story, when you are participating in a story, when you're reading a story, you, when you're hearing it, you're trying on uh, the problems of that story. You know what I mean? You are there with the hero. You are in the trenches or on the mountaintop. You walk with them through the valley the whole time. And as you see their challenges and their solutions, you try those solutions on too. We get these opportunities to envision these problems and their solutions that we're never going to encounter in real life. I'm never going to have to go all the way to Mordor to throw the ring in, but I have my own version of challenge that allows me to kind of role play and think to myself, well, what would the characters in these challenges do? Narrative gives us context within our own lives to kind of push forward and problem solve in ways that aren't accessible to us through our own lived experience. Uh, when you're making a story, I, I often find it's really important to, to define certain things. Uh, this is a sort of incomplete list, but I use this list quite often when I'm looking at stories that I'm making to make sure that I've covered all of my bases. Uh, I think this is not a list that needs to be determined in any particular order. I've built stories out of each one of these individually and slowly added on the pieces, but thinking about these is really important. Uh, Defining your audience, I think, is one of the central things to telling any good story. And there's two ways in which you need to define your audience. I think the primary way is think about who is going to hear your story, listen to your story, see your story, be in your story. Uh, like the actual human beings who will eventually consume this thing are really important. I'm going to tell a very different story to a group of 15-year-olds than I'm going to tell to a group of 55-year-olds. And that's not a value judgment, that's just a method of my art. When we're professionals, we often don't get to choose who our prospective audience is, so taking into account who our audience is as we design is really important. Uh, you also, especially in the immersive environment, want to think about who your audience is inside your story. Your audience is there for a reason, and sometimes they're characters, sometimes they're ghosts, sometimes they're observers, sometimes they've been called in as specialized scientists or they're voters. But whatever that is, to remember what role your audience plays is a really important thing for making your story feel real and robust. Um, your setting. Your setting is where your story takes place, but it's also the world in which your story takes place. Like it might be, you know, the abandoned warehouse, but your setting is also the post-apocalyptic world in which the abandoned warehouse is there. Uh, in an immersive environment, you only can design so far out to the edges in scale, but conceptually, you can design the world as far as you want. Uh, your aesthetic. Are you a noir? Are you a sci-fi? Uh, are you a comedy or tragedy? Um, are you a, f a wonderful dance piece? Are you a very sad game? Uh, just some of these basic things are really helpful. Uh, you can often start with these. You're like, oh, you know, I really want to make a noir party game. And that will influence the set of decisions that you make from then forward. Uh, characters. I think characters are one of the most important things for creating a story that has emotional impact. Uh, people don't really care about things that happen to people that they don't care about. Uh, and so creating characters that are relatable is really important. And you kind of need that all the way through. Too often people try to make a really good protagonist and really bad antagonist, and they figure that setting those against each other is going to be enough. 
And in reality, the stories that we respond to are the ones where we kind of get it on both sides. We kind of see it. We kind of know why Jon Snow has to do what he does, but also why Daenerys has to do what she does. Like we kind of see it. And so we're really invested. We can put ourselves in either place. Um, I often use characters to sort of drive my plot as an engine. And my characters often are defined by their flaws and their hungers, you know, more than their strengths. I think about my characters as what they're bad at and what their need, needs are and what they're gonna, what they're gonna sacrifice everything for. Uh, obstacles or conflict. Um, your characters need to want something and there needs to be something in the way of them getting it. Something that sometimes is, is internal, sometimes it's external, uh, sometimes it is conceptual, sometimes it is physical, and all of those make great stories. To get the treasure, to have to get through the wall, of your own dismay versus getting through the physical wall that you have to watch the character hammer through with a physical hammer, these are both very compelling. Uh, events, what are the events in your story? What is happening in your story? What happens and then what happens? Uh, something to keep in mind is oftentimes the events of your story are not told in a linear fashion even though they are sequential. So often it is actually wise to begin the telling of your story in the middle and leave things for later to be discovered at the end. Um, Deeper meanings uh, sometimes. So uh, I think a lot of times people get stuck on this one and I don't think that it's super necessary. Like I think a lot of people try to make a story that like is gonna mean something or really say something. But in the end, I, I think the, the act of making that story is already, you're gonna have deeper meaning there. You're a person with thoughts and feelings. You live in the time that you live in the context that you live in and you're not gonna be able to avoid expressing yourself. I, I think concentrating on, on making a story that's really rich and robust internally will almost always result in a story that people can find meaning and, and uh, weight to. Uh, okay, so yeah, these are things that I use. I actually have this list up. Sometimes I add things or subtract things, but whenever I'm composing the story, I actually go through this list and I'll usually bullet point out and make sure that I have these different components as I'm starting to structure. So uh, this is something I think a lot about. Uh, tell stories that matter to people who are interested at times that are relevant. Um, uh, stories are about context, you know, and we see that all the time. Like sometimes stories become more meaningful or less meaningful. Uh, right now, I've, I'm really interested in the story of the 1918 pandemic, which three months ago I didn't know existed. Uh, but now it's a story that matters to me, that I relate to, that I care about, that I find ways to tie into my own life. Uh, Telling stories that matter to people who are interested at times that are meaningful to them is the way to have impact. Uh, it's important to really think about who your audience is and what they need and want uh, when you're making your story. It, it's one thing to express yourself and, and just make something that you love, but when you wanna really be, it's one thing to express yourself and it's one thing to try to uh, make yourself understood. Uh, and I always think that if I wanna, have the people in my audience really relate and grab onto my story, I need to think about who they are and what they want and how they see themselves in context of my story. Uh, okay, so I have some examples that we can uh, look at together. Uh, so the shadows, this is a, a character design that we did, like I said, where we surveyed the members of our potential audience about their fears about the world. Everything from economic fears to fears that they were uh, to their own political ambivalence and things like that. And we really like carefully crafted every word that was said. Uh, the shadows were weirdly non, uh, they would interact a lot with each other, but they were hard to have a conversation with. They were almost mirrors themselves. They would reflect things back to you that you said. Uh, for a moment, yeah, this is great. I uh, thought you guys might like to look at the character design sheet. We do a lot of character design uh, in my work. And so it's nice to look at sort of the back end of how we do this. Um, you can see we have a basic description uh, in word form, and then we have sort of a mood board that comes up. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I take a moment because we're on a large video call. There we go. Uh, and you can see, so this is sort of where we start, is we start with just a little bit of a vision, uh, a little sketch that I make in my notebook. Uh, and then we sort, of, uh, we sort of go on a quest for visual things uh, that inspire us. Uh, I'm a big Samurai Jack fan. Uh, and so we found a mask maker who was willing to work with us and uh, really design these out. And he prepared some different sketches and inspirations for us. And you can really see how, how these things are immediately evocative. And by building these characters out around that feeling, 
it's uh, by building these characters out around that feeling, it's much easier for us to create something that is immediately evocative in itself. As soon as people would see the shadows coming down the hall or sneaking into their room, like they would have immediate visceral responses that would give them uh, interest. Uh, oh, another example. So this is another just a little character sheet that I've made of two characters called Slinky and Feather. We were working this year in opposition. Uh, we were thinking about dichotomies a lot and the dichotomies that can uh, set people against each other who are fundamentally alike. Uh, and so we created two characters, one sort of a uh, Willy Wonka-esque erudite um, Iron Man sort of uh, inventor, and one a sort of psychedelic Indiana Jones explorer, and they both found a rare new resource uh, together they, as collaborating scientists. And their differences in how they wanted to use that resource ended up tearing their whole world apart uh, and destroying them both. It's always interesting to me when I'm trying to make characters, like I said, to try to create characters that are relevant to the people who are going to be watching them. Uh, in this time period, this is about two years ago, uh, there's a lot of conflict and impersonal conflict that is starting to be fomented on uh, the internet. We're, we're going to talk about this more a little bit later in the talk. Uh, but the, the sort of intentional division inside of like-minded groups is something that I was very interested in. And so what I did, what we did during this production is we created intentional division. We created two equally appealing protagonists and then really exhorted the participants to take sides in this essentially meaningless debate. Uh, we really uh, like pushed people to have to commit and even would start to hold parallel theatrical events and so that people had to choose uh, we cultivated FOMO really extensively. We often would put things against each other so that people could not possibly see both things and they would have to make decisions that mattered in terms of their impact. And again, all of this sort of grew out of this kernel of looking at actual interpersonal relationships inside of this community and figuring out what the character design that we wanted to do was. Uh, oh, expectations. Uh, so oftentimes when people tell stories, uh, they try to do something totally new and different. This is like a very common thing that people want is they, they're like, I'm trying to tell something that's never been done before. And I actually think that genres and tropes are really great things that people should use more often, especially as beginner storytellers. Uh, people really like to have their expectations met and people expect to get something they want to get it. Oftentimes this is so true that even if it's going to be bad, as long as people expect it to be bad, they would rather it be bad and meet their expectations than be good. Uh, and this is really important in storytelling when we're trying to give people a journey that feels cathartic and meaningful. We want to make sure that although we don't do everything that they expect, that we do the things that they emotionally require to gain catharsis. Uh, I often think that the reason that tropes and some of these sort of basic hero's journey cycles and things like that, one of the reasons that they survive is sort of as tired seeming as they sometimes are is because they work really well people respond to them, people will always come back to them. And they, they have a consistency of format that allows us, the designers, to really play with a lot more fluency. The idea of a journey where someone leaves home and comes back is not new, but that allows us to give the story of a homecoming all these different meanings and context as storytellers. Uh, the other thing I love about uh, genres is it allows us to get really weird with people while making them think that they feel okay about it. So uh, when you're doing something that people totally understand and you give them some comfort, you can really experiment a lot more with, for instance, the type of participation that you're expecting from people when they feel like they understand the world that they're inside of. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that in a moment on the next slide. Uh, the other thing I often think about is giving people an ending that they want, but not the ending that they expect. Um, if there's supposed to be the great showdown between the good character and the bad character, the unexpected ending can be a lot of things, but robbing people of that showdown is, is very unsatisfying. There's certain things that like people often try to turn leftwards at their end to give us something that we didn't know that we wanted. But I, I often find that it's good to actually give people the ending, the, the emotional ending that they want, of victory, of defeat, of hope, of, of despair, uh, but just find a new way to do that. Uh, okay. So Space Pilots in Space. Uh, this is a show that I do with 13th Floor. Uh, like I said, 13th Floor is a very adaptable theater company. And Space Pilots in Space is our sci-fi show that we've been running. We are now in season five of our sci-fi show. Uh, the original season was actually something that we devised when I was running a radio station at a large weekend long festival. It was an FM radio station. 
And we were doing, in addition to music, we were doing lots of fake news and weather and stuff like that on the FM. And we had seeded radios, FM radios all around the site. Uh, and myself and the uh, producer of 13th Floor, uh, Jenny, who's the woman standing in the back in this photo, uh, we came up with this idea of trying to do an old school 1950s sci-fi radio play where the audio came over the radio so that the participants could hear it, but that the performance could actually be done live physically if you could find it. And so we had the opportunity to play out different scenes at different points around the venue. Things would appear and disappear. But because there was audio all over the venue, people knew that it was happening. We did a chase scene up and down and across a stage running through a musical performance. We had a live birth scene in the swimming pool. All of this over the radio that people had to carry and chase us and find us and find where the show was happening. Uh, season two, we actually changed it again and we decided to be much more interactive. We, we turned it into a uh, party where we threw, a, we threw an event that was space themed, but unbeknownst to the people coming to the space themed party, our spaceship crash lands into the party, gets stuck in the party. There's, and then everyone at the party has to join the crew of the USSS Punisher and help unlock the ship from the party and extract us and return us to our own time. Uh, it's interesting to do a show where you are doing something recurring because when you have certain through lines, it really allows you to change things. We went from a piece that was very immersive, but not very interactive, where people had to look around and find us and it seemed like we were everywhere and they were inside of us, to a piece that was extremely interactive. You had to save the ship, repair the engine, uncover the secret communication code that allowed us to communicate with the alien, and all of that had to be done by the participants or the space pilots would never get home. Uh, we've recently transitioned this into a Zoom show. So now we have a sort of variety Zoom show similar to, I like to think of it as like the, uh, the Muppet show in space a little bit. It's, we are sending episodes back in time. But the thing that's interesting to me as a story is by using the context of a familiar sort of spaceship, where we have a crew of motley yet talented individuals who all somehow pull it together We've been able to take our audience on these crazy rides and allow them to run up and down mountains with us, get into the pool and get wet with us, tune in every week to our radio show and things like that. That if we were trying to reinvent our wheel in terms of what the story was, we would lose our audience very quickly. All right. Immersive, interactive, and collaborative. Uh, these are three words that I think are often used in art design right now and are not often delineated from each other very well. Uh, so this is something that I want to talk about a little bit. I want to talk about what each one of these words means and the different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of ways to do art and they're, they're all correct. You're not going to, you're not going to mess up. It's a, you're, not every story has to be immersive. Not every story has to be anything. Some stories that are great and that I love won't fit into any of these categories, but these are options that we have. And it's a way for us to sort of delineate what aspects of stories are useful to look at. Uh, so we'll start with immersive. That's the title of this piece. And that's a word that I hear thrown around a lot. Uh, to me, immersive is really about feeling like as a participant that I am inside the environment of the story. That when I look around, that when I smell, that when I walk around, that the things I touch, the things I, the things I talk to, the things I hear, that as much as possible, this will allow me to feel like I'm inside the environment of the story. Uh, there's a bunch of things that come from this. So frequently it's environmental. Right. Uh, I know you guys talked about Meow Wolf and I'll talk about Meow Wolf a little bit more in a minute, but it's a great example of an immersive piece where inside the boundaries of the venue, it is completely designed so that everything that you touch, everything that you hear is going to be involved in the storyline. Uh, multiple senses are engaged. Usually in a well thought out immersive piece, it's not just something to look at. The best ones that I have had are not only something to hear, but there's something that touches you, something that you touch, something that you taste, things that you smell even kinesthetic things, things that you have to crouch and crawl underneath, move around in. These are parts of engaging the different senses of a person to really make the reality robust. Uh, multiple levels and scales of detail. This is actually something that's really important when you're doing an immersive piece. Uh, there's, it's one thing to dress up your room, uh, to dress up a room so that it comes in and it looks like a laboratory, but then in an immersive environment, people are going to do everything, including open the drawers and look at the papers. And then every paper inside of that has, a, has something on it. And so that's the sort of level of scale that you need to get to. That when people start to open things and look in the pockets, uh, untie the thing and look underneath, they really want to see that you, the creator, have, have taken the time to go all the way down to the details. Uh, 
I love to tell this story about Meow Wolf. I, I went there uh, and uh, as a creator, it's a really inspirational place. I think you guys have covered it in your curriculum, but I was in a fake office inside of the Meow Wolf environment. Uh, and I was, I was looking through the books on the walls and I heard this little sound uh, coming out of a pipe on the wall. It's just like, uh, like hissing, clanging, like tink, tink, tink. I mean, it's like kind of annoying. And I look over and this pipe is connected to the radiator on the wall. And, you know, like an old timey, like metal radiator. And I'm sitting there, I was like, oh man, it's funny, but it's good to know that even at Meow Wolf, like they have heating problems, like that they can't get that stuff together. And then I stopped and I was like, wait, I am not in an office. I'm not in a building. This is, this is not real. That radiator is not real. That pipe is not real. That pipe is only making a sound because they designed it to make a sound. And so I walked over and I put my ear up to the pipe. And if you put your ear all the way up to the pipe, the pipe is making music. It's singing quietly. And you can only hear it if you get there. And to me, that was this moment where I was like, oh, they just did such a good job drilling all the way down to the bottom that even a person like me who is going to hear just this little thing, if I go and check under the hood, there's going to be something there for me to look at. Um, Multiple mediums and modes of expression. Uh, immersive environments are great for finding new ways to do things, uh, to find as many ways to do something as possible. So there should be something that you read, there should be something that you watch, there should be a show that you see, there's a person to talk to. There's as many different ways to layer in the details as your project can encompass and afford realistically. Uh, conceptually immersive. I actually think about this one a lot when we do uh, multi-day events. It's important that it's not just that it seems like it is a physical environment, but that the environment feels robust enough that it might go beyond the realm of what you as a creator can touch physically. Uh, this is a really great opportunity to have digital and uh, internet connections to things. So if I'm creating a physical experience, but I want it to seem even more robust and to go beyond the boundaries of my building, what I can do is if there are social channels that you can link up so that going into the experience, you can follow the protagonist Instagram and see that that is an ongoing thing. Or if as people are going around, we've done this before, we, uh, we graffitied with the slogans that we had created inside the party for the plot. We, we set up stickers and wheat paste around the neighborhood for about three blocks in every direction. So as you're walking to the party, it seemed like the organization that we were setting up inside was actually outside. Uh, creating these opportunities for people to think that things go further is really important in an immersive environment. Uh, oh, and right here at the end, I have, uh, in quotes, put things in dark corners. This is something I remind myself a lot when I'm creating immersive environments. It's like, people will always check on it. I, we, were doing a, um, we were doing an arsenic and old lace like many, 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 many years ago. Uh, this was like very early in the world of immersive. It was actually not even an immersive show. It was like um, almost in the round, like no stage boundary arsenic and old lace. And uh, I remember the production designer at the time uh, I, if you don't know this play, these two old ladies kill people and bury them in the basement. Uh, and it, it's a fine romp comedy, but there is a body in the window seat that features very prominently. People see it and there's a discovery and all this. And uh, I remember the production designer at the time was like, well, we need to have a body to go in the window seat. And I was like, why? And he was like, well, because audiences, if they can get to it, will always look. And sure enough, I would say one in every three nights, somebody from the audience during intermission would sneak into the set and open the, open the seat to see if there was a body in the window seat. So it was always good that we had it to satisfy that person's curiosity. Uh, okay, so that's immersive, but interactive is something that is different and also important. And I think these two terms are often conflated. Uh, immersive is like this very environmental robustness, this very like making it seem real to me as a, as a thing that I could touch and be inside of. Interactive is much more about my choices that I have available. So when I'm in an interactive environment, it's not just about what can I do, but what can I do that will change what is happening to me? So interactive environments are where there are choices available to the participants. There's a bunch of different ways that we can talk about choice, and I'll be talking about this throughout the talk. But one of the types are choices that affect their own experience versus choices that ex affect the experience of other participants which is really interesting. Uh, oftentimes in interactive environments, video games being a great example, uh, you'll have choices that affect what happened to you, but it's a really nice feeling when you can change things and they're changed for other people. Deformable terrain is often a really nice way to feel interactive because 
it's not just something that I can see, I can change it and it remains changed for the duration of my and the other people in the experiences experience. If I knock something down, blow something up, paint a wall or change something, that remains true and important and impactful to whatever degree. Uh, it's also important that these choices, if they're gonna be interactive, affect what happens to me. My choices should have consequences and impact. Uh, it's interesting to think about what kinds of choice you have, and we'll dig into this more a little bit later, but I shouldn't be able to make this, like if I have a different set of choices than someone else who experiences it, I should have a profoundly and distinctly different experience. Uh, there's a couple different types of choices. I, I like to think of intentional choice versus ability choice, uh, which is often a good distinction to draw for your own design. Intentional choices are like if I have a place where there's a room and there are two doors and the person can decide to go through the door on the left or the door on the right. It is up to them. There's no coercion. I might put the character in to tell them to do this or to do that, but like in the end, they get to choose. Ability choice is more like a challenge. It's like trying to pass a level. It's like there's a door and it is locked and there's a combination or a secret word. And it's weird to think about this as a choice, right? Like if I'm able to know the word or climb up the thing or get underneath or kill the bad guy or solve the riddle. But from a design standpoint, it's very interesting to look at both of these things because sometimes I want there to be like a free range of what choices the participant can have. But sometimes I want what they are able to do to impact what happens to them. And so it's like, oh, did you solve the riddle or did you have to go through the emergency exit door? Oh, did you get defeated by the bad guy or did you defeat the bad guy? And to have the story not stop or end, but instead have that accomplishment or lack thereof change what happens to the participant, as opposed to just, oh, did I go for red or blue? Uh, another type of choice is sandbox choice. I mentioned deformable terrain already. Sandboxes are a great way to sort of feel like you have a lot of choices, when in fact, it's just a sort of wide array of predetermined choices. Do I wanna go over here or do I wanna go over here? Do I wanna put this on top or underneath? Uh, these are great environments, really fun for people, and they feel very much like they have a lot of freedom, even when those freedoms have been predefined. Um, build for the haters. So when you are building an environment that has a lot of choices available, um, there's always gonna be people who choose, who don't wanna make any of the choices that you have designed for them. There's always gonna be people who don't like the choices that have been set out for them. That's just part of humanity. And so when I'm designing, especially for large groups, I always try to design specifically for those people. Easy to design for the people who are in the middle. Easy to design for the people who will just go along and be happy to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take the door on the left because he said to whatever. Uh, but designing for the people who are gonna be most likely to refuse your choices is when things get really special in an interactive environment. Uh, we did one year an event that was entirely based, of, uh, the theme was cheese. Uh, it was a fairly arbitrary theme for reasons that don't matter to this story, but everything was about cheese and the characters cared about cheese and all these projects were cared about cheese. Uh, and we knew this would be a highly divisive theme in a lot of ways because a lot of people don't like cheese or are dairy free or are vegan or whatever. But we in fact ended up designing an entire ARG around being uh, dairy free. We, we in fact created an entire line of the plot for the people that we knew would come in and be like, I don't like cheese. I don't want to get involved in this. What else is for me, there for me to do? And they didn't know it at the time, but we thought of them too. And that ended up being a very popular part of the experience that a lot of non-dairy free people ended up joining because it was a really fun gift that we had left. We gave something for everyone. There were choices even for the people who didn't like our choices. And that's, I think, really important. Uh, all right, collaborative. Uh, so collaborative is really special and often not thought about within this structure, but I think it is important. Collaborative means that the participants have freedoms available beyond what was determined by the designer. So that means that you don't know what's gonna happen. That's, that's a real playground that you build that you don't entirely know what will occur. Uh, things like this, so like uh, Burning Man is a great example. Like there's a structure there within, in, within which people make things, but the actual details of what goes on is so far beyond the intent of the original de event designer that it takes on a new form that goes beyond immersive or interactive. It really is collaborative. Uh, when you're making a collaborative project, when that's your intention, you want to think about having really minimal architecture. You want to think about having less restrictions. The more restrictions that you have, the more intense, intense it's going to be for people to find their way through. That's okay. These aren't value judgments. Sometimes you want a more prescribed experience for people, that they're going to get what you anticipated. But when you're making a collaborative experience, 
you can't even anticipate what they're going to get. You have to let go of that. Uh, one great way to make a collaborative project is to give problems without creating a solution. I love doing this. This is one of my favorite things to do to a group of people is to give them a box with no, that has no password that I know and be like, I don't know, figure it out. Because it becomes a different kind of experience where they're really in the driver's seat suddenly. They have to determine how much they want to solve it and what that means. Uh, also, when you're collaborating, on, when you're making a collaborative project, you have to be willing to let go of your story. Uh, the participants will always do it differently than you thought. And if you're making this type of project, that has to be the beauty of it. Over designing and creating your own expectations is only going to lead to heartbreak. Uh, great. So it's just a little incomplete comparison just to show the three together that you can see immersive sensory environmental varying scale uh, for the explorers. You can see at the last bullet point on each one here, I have words that I haven't introduced yet. We'll talk about them in one second. But these are great ways to think about design and how to appeal to different types of people who like different things. Okay, we're going to do some examples. Uh, so I do this quite a lot when I go to places is I um, do a little exercise where I determine how much they are of each of these scales. This is not a reductive thing. I, there are lots of ways to make a lens. There's lots of ways to do anything. Uh, but it's good to look at. So here we have Meow Wolf. Meow Wolf is extremely immersive. Something's beeping at me. I wonder what it is. I wonder if it's this Zoom call. I don't hear any beeping, so hopefully it's just at your end, Zach. Okay, I will ignore it. Yeah, Thank you. Sounds clear. Okay. It's okay, so Meow Wolf is extremely immersive, right? Meow Wolf is like every nook and cranny is designed. Under the carpet is more carpet. It's like an incredible place. Uh, but in reality, it is not actually extremely interactive. There are some choices that you can do that will turn on or turn off a thing, but there's not actually a lot of choices that will change your experience substantially, where you you will see something that wasn't available to somebody else because of their choices. It's more of a matter of, did you look over all of the map? Uh, it's actually a very uncollaborative project. You are not allowed to paint on the walls. You are not allowed to take the things off that they haven't intended for you to do. Every secret that is there to be found is there to be found on purpose. Uh, Sleep No More is another famous example. Some of you might have heard this uh, about this project. Some of you might not have. Sleep No More is an immersive Macbeth inside of a building in Manhattan. It started in London. Uh, in this, essentially what they have is they have a very abstracted version of Macbeth. It's an hour long loop. It runs two, three different times over the course of the building and you, the audience, sort of have free range of the building to walk around and see the scenes in any particular order that you want. Uh, this is another great example of an immersive piece where it's very environmental. Right, like there's a lot of things for you to see. You can just stay in a room with no one and just look in that room. They've done the set dressing beautifully. Uh, it also has a middling amount of interaction. There are times when you, the participant, can have an experience where because you followed this person and not that person, something totally different happened to you. There's intimate experiences with single performers that happen that only to one or two people each time. But that being said, it's only of limited interaction. The choices that you're afforded are very few beyond look around and see what you can find, which is more of an immersive flavor. It's again, it's not a very collaborative experience because if you were to try to say, say your own lines or begin to become a character, very quickly you would find yourself ejected from the performance. Uh, Fortnite, uh, so this is another experience. It's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, video games are very interactive. They are great for interactive environments because there's so much choice that you can program in for people. Uh, video games are typically not very immersive. Uh, there are definitely exceptions, but they're primarily visual and they're primarily uh, visual and sound. You can sometimes get into the scale of immersivity with certain games, uh, Myst being a great one where you can start to draw, open the books and drawers and things and look into it. But generally speaking, they, they tend to be uh, mostly uh, interactive. Uh, Collaboration is very difficult in a video game environment, I find, but uh, Fortnite has been working on trying to bring up more opportunities for people to not play their game, but still be in their environment and do other things. Uh, keep moving here. Ah, Dungeons and Dragons. This is a great one. It's a great example of a robust experience with a high collaboration score. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever played this game. It's generally not very immersive. There's not a lot going on except the words that people say to each other and there's imagination. It's extremely interactive. There's no end to the choices that you can make. But more than that, it's collaborative in that there's, the players can make any choice at any time. They can go beyond what was thought possible or reasonable by the person running the game. The person designing the game has no real control over what happens in the story, to be honest, other than at the most basic outline sense. 
Uh, if you've never played, it's definitely worth playing, especially now in this time, it's getting, becoming popular again. Uh, so great. Oh, good. Now you do it. So we're going to take a moment here. I've been talking for a little while. Uh, and you can just take this exercise and do it for yourself. So if you have a piece of paper nearby, uh, you can maybe grab it. I have a little example sheet for you here. And uh, you can make three lines on a piece of paper and do one of these for yourself. Select an experience that you have had, you know, select an art piece that is interesting to you. It can be anything. Uh, you can assess anything through these scales. Some of them are more interesting than others. So take a moment to like do this for yourself and like make little marks on a piece of paper. Um, yeah, I was thinking about lots of things that, you know, like some things are gonna score low on all of these, some will score higher. Again, this is not a value judgment and this is not the only way to have qualities. There's other kinds of qualities, emotionality, relatability, you know, but these are just the three that we happen to be looking at at this moment. Uh, so if uh, so, for everybody's benefit, if um, you can't think of a project that you want to um, rate on these scales, remember you've seen quite a few uh, so far in what Roxy and I have showed you. Think back to the projects that we looked at at the very beginning of the um, uh, the very beginning of the quarter. Um, think about the projects that we've showed you more recently, or feel free to pick a project that is, has not even been discussed yet in the in Art 75. So um, you have a couple more minutes to work on this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe even consider each other's projects, right? And do this in peer review. Great. Might be as well. Good thinking. And feel free, to me, this is not, uh, these are all sliders. They're independent. Some things can be a lot of all of them. Some things can be a little of them. And just having a lot of all of them doesn't make your project better. These are just different ways of balance. It's like salt, too much salt, too little salt. It's about having the right amounts of things to fit your project. Um, I'm not sure how we can do some interaction, but I, I can keep going. I've got some more stuff to talk about. Uh, yeah, finish up your thing. If you want to throw any of your results in the chat or we can go over to the q and uh, does that make sense? Well, well Zach, um, maybe somebody wants to uh, comment on them now. Um, you guys can uh, put up your hand in the participant and we'll uh, uh, find you in the participants window and enable you there. Or if you um, would prefer to put your um, ideas in the chat, that'd be fine too. And we'll make time for a couple of people if anyone wants to share your assessment on these three scales of a particular project. Or if you're having any questions too. If, you're, if any of it's missing the mark, now's a good time to ask. Yeah. Lots of silence. Going once. Oh, Edgar. Edgar <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah. Hello there. Um, Edgar. Something. Hi, Zach. You're awesome, by the way. Something I was thinking about is um, uh, VR and um, where that would fall in the immersive, interactive, and collaborative scale. And I, I've scored it pretty high in immersiveness and interactiveness. And I figure a lot of stuff, depending on what the actual program you're running, um, would vary when it comes to collaboration. But VR is something I'm really interested in working with. And um, I figure it would cover a lot of bases, no matter what you're really doing. And I was wondering if uh, you might have any experience with it and working with it. Totally, this is a great question. Uh, so let's talk about VR for a second and then that segues well into games as well. Uh, so you're right, VR has like got some great potential for immersiveness, uh, especially inside of video games. Uh, I would say that it's still got its limits, at least for the current technology around, uh, it's pretty limited to, to sight and sound still. Uh, there is some interesting experimenting being done with the vestibular thing and the 4D and the moving chairs and stuff like that, which starts to get you into this kinesthetic immersion, uh, which is really good. Uh, the interactivity is, of course, a matter of design, right, in, in this context. Like, you can create an, a VR environment that has no interactivity, where I go around, I just walk, and I hit flowers, and, never, and it's just beautiful, and it's just calm. 
uh, which is not actually very interactive, but it's very robust anyway. It's not a bad thing to not be totally interactive, but it doesn't give me a lot of choices that uh, substantially affect my experience. Collaborative is very difficult in a digital video game environment. Uh, and this is something I'll talk about a lot, but it's very difficult because in a video, in a virtual environment, you have to explicitly program and predetermine all of the things available to the player. There's no way for them to find stuff that you didn't leave for them because there's nothing real there, uh, which is okay. It creates some of the most robust interactive environments because of that, because you can put so many choices in every detail and every pixel can be chosen. Uh, but it does make it difficult for people to sort of step way outside the boundaries of what you as a designer have determined is possible. It's not impossible though, and, and we'll talk about some of this in a moment. Uh, One more question, comment, contribution? There was a question in the chat. Oh, go ahead. And, and, uh, Jordan, I think you were going to speak up and then we'll deal with the chat question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's a question, so I'm just going to kind of like talk it out. Go but for it. What's interesting to me was this idea in, I think you said 13th floor, you had a series, like y'all did five seasons of something. Um, so this concept of like it not being recorded, it not being a TV show. Um, so that the audience is like key. Um, so do you have like, I know cause there's no preference between um, immerse, not preference, but just like hierarchy between immersive, interactive, and collaborative. But why do you think that you gravitate towards these um, huge theatrical events that like will only be seen one time in the sense of like not recorded? Um, I mean, I, I come from, my background is a lot of theater and live performance, especially when I was like a uh, kid, like I did a lot of theater, theater and live theater. Um, I, I do, I believe that there is something different and visceral about having an ex experience that you are right in front of that you can almost reach out and touch. Um, there's, there's interesting things that happen though in, this, in terms of the internal impact on people when you're in something that feels real. Uh, you know what I mean? When you are participating, you're, it, it takes that story inside of you. And now you are not just reading the words, you're saying the words, you're not just reading the gestures, you're making the movements. And like the power for role play is, is much more, uh, is much stronger there. Actually, let me, let me keep talking because I'm going to talk about this right now. Uh, and we'll have more time for questions at the end, but I have a little bit more I want to talk about games. Is that all right? Yeah, and uh, if you could, that's a great, um, good thoughts and question, Jordan. And um, uh, there is a question in the chat, which um, is, could you, could Disneyland be used in as, a, as an example? Yes. Uh, it's highly immersive. Oh, yeah. That's a classic example, right? I, I would say Disneyland is responsible for a lot of the major design principles in immersive environments right now. Um, it, it, they they just really had the money to do it. You know what I mean? They had the money to really spend the time to make the haunted mansion look like ghosts and really like even back in the 1970s. Uh, there's a great book about Disneyland uh, and the experience design in it. Uh, also, if I don't know, I'm in the Bay Area, and if you ever have a chance to go to Children's Fairyland in Oakland, that's the, basically the proto Disneyland. Uh, it was there about 20 years before Disneyland began, uh, and in micro reproduces most of the mechanics that Disney is still using, into, including the fully like immersive environment with the different lands that you can go to where like Tomorrowland is like future land is right near past land and you can travel between them. Uh, the characters walking around in costume that you can interact with, that was a fairyland thing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great piece. I actually, that was my first job as a child is I worked as a character at Children's Fairyland Oakland. So I have been wow. doing immersive performance for a long time. Uh, okay, games. Games are really great. This is actually like, this, this goes into what we're talking about. So games are a defined set of voluntary behavior protocols that elicit an anticipatable result. That's a lot of words. You will get these slides later. But what it really means is games are a set of rules for how people are allowed to act that result in something that happens pretty much the same every time. Right? It's a little dance choreography. It's a social dance choreography where it's like, this is what we say to each other. This is how we do it within the context of this game. And every time it will produce a winner, a laugh, 
whatever it's supposed to make. The important things here are the defined set of behaviors. This is what makes a game a game. Whenever we're talking about games, it is great to think about Bartle's player taxonomy. If you haven't looked at this, you should totally look at this. I think about this all the time. Uh, he divides the types of interaction inside of games into these four categories, which I will broadly summarize. Achievers are people who like to check all the boxes. They like to win the game. They like to get the most points. They like badges. They like to show that they are third on the leaderboards. You know what I mean? They like to get an A. They, they, achievers are great. They will participate in your project and really try to go to get all the medals. Socializers a little bit differently. They get value out of experiences because of the social interactions that they have. These people will often go do what their friends are doing or be like, hey, there's a crowd of people over there. Let's go see what's going on. Socializers are much more interested in the interactions that they get to have around your design rather than in what the design is specifically. Explorers are people who like to go look at everything. People who like to go all the way to the edge of the map and come back and then they're like, oh, but I haven't been upstairs yet. Let's go upstairs. Oh, and guys, I think there's a room in the basement. Let's go down to the basement. Not so much about going and doing everything in there, but going and seeing all the different stuff and looking in every crack and making sure that all of those things have happened. The final category are the breakers or the killers. Uh, these are the people whose form of entertainment is the format of your design. Uh, and these are sometimes your biggest fans. These are the people who really appreciate and know that they're in an experience and in a game. But these are also the people that if they don't like your game, will try to break your game. They can see inside of the design process and they can see, oh, this is what you want me to do. But if you haven't done a good enough job, they will, their entertainment will be exploiting the flaws in your design. I, the breakers and the haters, these people are really great because if you find that you are designing for them, they will be the most loyal, most enthusiastic participants. They are often the most highly, uh, they have the highest refined taste of all the four, but that means they get really irritated if things aren't very good. They'll, they'll try to mess up your stuff. You'll find this all the time on online experiences, by the way. People, if they can, they will break your game. And so it's good to design for robustness. Uh, it's good to take a moment to think about who you are. Uh, I know that I, for myself, am definitely, like I'm an explorer, a socializer, and then a breaker if I'm bored. If I go into a new place, I'll be, I do, I want to go upstairs and then downstairs. I want to go over on the balcony. Can we get out there? You know, like that's always what I'm doing. Even in a video game map, I'm like going to go up to the top of the mountain so that I can see around. Uh, I like to see my friends. I like to go to a thing because my friends are there and because I get to interact with people in a real way. Uh, but if I'm bored, I'm going to look under every rock. I'm going to open every fire escape door. I'm going to try to hack every puzzle and I'm going to see how far I can take it. Because if your entertainment's not good, my own entertainment will be better. Games. So the main thing about games is that the person playing the game is the main character in the story of a game. Tell people, tell stories to that, that matter to people who care and people care about themselves. When you're playing a game, the game is the story of you, how you beat it, how you failed to beat it, how you overcame the monster or did not. Games are great because now instead of people just in a story thinking about other people's solutions to novel situations, they are experiencing their own potential solutions for novel situations. What happens if you're attacked by orcs? What happens if you are given a gun and sent into a fake city? What happens if you are being, you know, told you can't go in there? There's all kinds of experiences that we never get to have here, but that in games we get to learn what we would do. And in fact, we get to try out one version of a solution and fail and try out another without a critical failure in between. Every game is an opportunity to role play an experience. Every game asks the player to take on the role, attacker, defender, victor, you know, whatever that happens to be in that moment. And so remembering that you're imparting an emotional experience to people when you make a game is really important, especially in immersive design. Choices are the most important thing in terms of people's interactive and immersive experience. There's different kinds of choices, but the choices that I want to talk about are real choices versus academic choice. Academic choice is great. Academic choice when we design are the, you know, take the door on the left or the door on the right, the red pill or the blue pill. Doesn't matter which door they take because we have hallways that we've made behind both of them. Real choices are different. Real choices are choices where people decide things on their own and we don't necessarily know how many doors there are off of those choices. It's a much riskier kind of design, but it can be, create a different set of experiences. All right, some examples. Uh, this is a video game. I, I am not a video game designer. I do some things in the video game world, but like the Stanley Parable that I did not work on, if you haven't played this game, 
it is a game about the illusion of choice in video games. And I highly recommend it. It's like $2 on Steam or something. You, you find yourself in a nondescript office being narrated what to do and where to go and how to feel. And the game is about your decision as a player and whether you decide to do what you're told or not. What quickly becomes apparent, though, is that it's an examination of the concept of choice in video games, that although you feel like you have the choice to obey or disobey the video game, in fact, all of those choices have been pre-prescribed to you, and so have the anti-choices, and so have the fake choices, and so is turning back. It's a really interesting examination as a designer of the limits of choice inside of that interactive design. All right, just an example. Uh, so there's a game uh, designed by Hoax Studio in San Francisco called The Racket. The Racket is a social noir party game that people play. Uh, and it's a really interesting game. It's got a lot of complex architecture, but in the end, when people are given their roles, their skills, and their goals, they end up in groups of up to 200 people performing a very specific set of social interactions that allowed them to trade, barter, and backstab each other to their heart's content. It's really interesting when considering a game such as this because Although the people inside of it experience it as a game where they're following the motivations that have been set out for them on the behavior protocols inside the rules, when you're standing outside the game, what you realize is it's also a performance piece about capitalism, about morals, and about crime and what people are willing to do. And in fact, the players of that game, although inside the game they are players, when you stand outside the game, they are performers. They are performing a choreographed dance that illustrates a point about what we'll do to each other when the rules let us do that. It's a really interesting game. You guys should look it up. Uh, find Yourself. Okay, so Find Yourself is a game that I made for a thousand person event that was a self-help conference. And it was very important that they felt that everyone meet each other. So I designed a thousand person four day getting to know you game called Find Yourself in which you extracted a random name tag of a participant. Your own name tag would be somewhere at the event and your mission was to go find yourself. This for me was an example of designing something with as few rules as possible to create the most complex set of possibilities for the participants. When I made this game, I didn't tell them where they would be or how they could find themselves, but that led to an incredibly complex set of emotional reactions in people for searching for themselves. Should they find themselves? Where are they? What are they up to right now out of their own sight? People's different commitment to this task led to a wide range of solutions from announcements and flyers to investigations and quests, all of which were far beyond the original constraints of my design. But I tried to leave enough room for everyone to go and solve their own problem and find themselves on their own. Okay, great. Uh, stories on the internet. So the internet kind of looks like this. Uh, it's pretty loud there, and telling stories there can be really difficult. Uh, I have a couple examples that I think are worth talking about. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have seen this news story. This is my favorite news story of the year. Uh, little Michaela's Instagram account was hacked by Bermuda. None of this matters. What is important is during this scandal, what became obvious is both Instagram influencers are entirely fake people. They are both CG uh, rendered influencers with AI personalities. Uh, Little Michaela has been in operation for several years, and what happened during this experience was that Bermuda attacked Little Michaela's Instagram account ostensibly to get Little Michaela to admit that she is a robot, which Little Michaela has denied for many years. There was a fierce debate and a bunch of flame wars, and eventually the two of them reunited, became friends, and took a picture together, which they posted on Instagram. The reason this story is mind bending to me is because none of this is real. No part of this is real. There's not even a real, like, even if it was real, it's not real. You know, like the, the beef between them is manufactured. The hacking of the Instagram attack is a piece of theater that they did. These aren't even real people on any level of the word real person. And yet, this is a huge story. And I find it fascinating to see what we will follow, what we will notice when it's hard to understand what's going on. Uh, this is another great story. This is a story that can only be told right now. Uh, I'm assuming everyone on earth at this point has seen Tiger King. Uh, if you haven't, you totally watch this banana story. It's on Netflix or wherever. Uh, the thing that became really apparent watching everybody go through the experience of watching this show is that nobody cares what really happened. You know what I mean? It's that 
the show does such a good job taking us on this wild ride through these crazy people and their lives and the revelation of their past and the future that the actual factual occurrences over what happened and if this person killed that person or if he knew about it, none of that matters. In fact, I as an audience member don't even want to know. I don't want to know if it's true. I don't want to know if she killed her husband. I want to know only what the show will take me because I'm along for the ride. I found out Cardi B has now gotten involved in the Free Tiger Joe movement and is now the head of that. The experience of this story of this man that started in the mid 90s with his reality show has become this awesome arc of insanity that we're all so willing to follow because whether it's true or not, whether it's manufactured or not, isn't the part that I'm excited about. Uh, so telling the story on the internet is very hard. This is your story. And when you're trying to get noticed on the internet, it can be difficult. You know, like standing out from the crowd is really hard. And so finding ways to take up space is really important. Uh, so what we've been doing in telling stories on the internet recently for the company that I work for now, Definitely Real, is we're trying to create this system in which we have a larger profile in this space. When you make a story on the internet, you can't just have your story. You need to have things around your story to allow people to find it, to see it, to know where it is, and for it to take up more space than it would have otherwise. Uh, when you're telling an internet native story, there needs to be stuff everywhere for people to find. There, there needs to be bits of it in the past and bits of it in the, that launch in the future. There needs to be parts on old websites and on new Twitter feeds. There needs to be things reshared and unshared and argued about. The internet doesn't allow for like a synchronous storytelling experience. It allows for this big mishmash of pieces. So oftentimes, because stories are everywhere and go everywhere, we want to take up our story. We want to grind it up into tiny pieces and kind of sprinkle it everywhere for people to find later. And then the hard part is creating these different on-ramps and connections between them. So that if somebody sees this Twitter post, they can click through to the link and find more and more of your story. It's like an elaborate sweater with many threads that can all get pulled on at once. One thing to remember when you're telling an internet native story is that the level of comprehension is going to go down. This always happens when we tell immersive things as well, that no matter how intricate our story is, we have to release some of the detailed, detailed comprehension from our expectation. Because when you're telling somebody that they're inside a story, you don't always know what's going on in the story. And I, I think this is really true when we consider our own experiences in stories. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a character inside the story of what's happening in America right now. And my story is that I'm confused. When you're telling a story and you want it to make it seem like it's real, you have to allow for certain parts of confusion to be in your audience while still hammering home your main bullet points. This often means you got to reduce your bullet points to just like one or two uh, and then say those over and over and over again. These are strategies that we're actually learning at our company from Fox News, from Russian troll organizations, from political pundits. The idea for how to create sort of cascading controversy where things connect to each other, argue with each other and disband has become an apparatus for storytelling almost in the last five years. At Definitely Real right now, we are working on a project that tells a story about misinformation and propaganda on the internet via the internet. And so we're telling a series of stories that connect together that are confusing as to their veracity or lack thereof, but really highlight the perils of an erosion of the boundary between truth and lies. Uh, it's a weird environment to tell a story in. Normally I tell a story in an environment where everything is confusing as to whether or not it's real, but you know that if you go six miles away, it's no longer real. Uh, on the internet, everything is everywhere. And so the, the sort of squishiness of the truth uh, becomes a lot more confusing. I, I think this is both like a problem that we're experiencing as a whole, but I think this is also an opportunity for storytellers to tell stories in new ways to people who care about them in places where they are. Uh, great, so that is all the stuff I had to talk about. And I now can take time for questions from anybody about any stuff. <laughs>